Our hope is that making this resource available will encourage people to realize that our growth in the life of Jesus is not just about switching the way we do church. It's not about finding different techniques or principles. Jesus has invited us to live in him by the power of the cross that frees us from shame, frees us from sin, and teaches us again how to love and trust him so that he can shape our lives as we journey forward. My prayer is that this lesson helps encourage that process in you as God leads you down the road. What I'm looking for in these days together is not that I'm going to give you something that is hot off Mount Zion, and this is the truth of God, and you need to believe this, or you're going to rot in hell forever, okay? I'm not there. Uh, I'm going to share part of my... Okay, you're welcome to go. Uh, I hope I say some things this weekend that are incredibly challenging to you, that challenge kind of your paradigms. And I'm not looking for you to agree with me. I'm not saying, oh, wow, that's the best stuff I've ever heard. You may walk out here going, I think that man's nuts. And uh, if you do, Monday, I'm going to be safely back in California and I won't come bother you again. So fair enough. I'm not looking for agreement. I'm going to share with you things that I have kind of struggled through over 12 years of my journey. Some of the things I'm sharing with you, I'm still struggling through. Um, so I don't expect you this weekend to say, wow, I love that. You might, there might be some things you hear say, wow, I love that. You might hear some other things and say, I don't know about that. <laughs> and so I hope our prayer is God, what's true, make it real to us, not this weekend over time. If this weekend works for me uh, and works for you, I, I really don't think when we get to Sunday afternoon, you're going to be a different person than you are. Okay, we're going to hear a lot of things, and even things you're going to say, wow, that sounds really good to me. But isn't living them a very different reality? I think the fruit of this thing doesn't come Monday morning. The fruit of this thing is going to come six months to five years down the road as God makes sense of these in your life. I'll give you an example about what I mean by kind of getting it, kind of catching what we're talking about. Uh, Sarah and I dated for three and a half years through college and got married six days after we graduated together in Tulsa. And we drove up to Ohio, where she's from, and got married in Ohio a little, a little under a week later. And uh, our honeymoon night, got up the next morning, we're going down to breakfast in this hotel. And uh, I'm kind of a news junkie, even, even on honeymoon, I want to grab a newspaper. So I, I stopped at a thing and I tried to find some change. I said, I don't have some change. And Sarah said, here, I'll get it. And she pulls out her purse. And I'm like, no, no, I'll get it. And I still didn't realize that there was no more my money, her money. See, all through college, it was my money, her money, who's going to pay for what. And we've been married. And now there was no my money, her money. It was all our money. But I, I, immediately when she said, I'll get it. I said, no, no, no. I'll get, I was going to go get change. And she had perfectly good change in her hand because I wasn't ready to live relationally yet with her. Does that make sense? I think there's so many things with God like that. Things happen, and there's certain truths that are established, but we still don't live in the reality of those things. In fact, we still live as if religion is the course of the day because we've all been schooled in it from the day we were born. And this is not what the institutions have created. My goodness, you people get religion without ever going to an institution. In fact, if you look over the course of human history, we'll talk about some of this over the course of the next little bit. Uh, you'll see that every group of people that got together have some kind of religious underpinning to that life together. Uh, even groups that don't have, quote unquote, the truth of Christianity, but tribal groups and you know tribes from all over the world had religious underpinnings. And there's some very common things to those religious underpinnings. One, you have a local holy man guru, uh, who, whether that's a man or a woman, it's a witch doctor, a cleric, or an imam, or a pastor, or whatever. You have a local holy man guru. You have some kind of sacred space, some kind of, whether it's a, an altar or a totem pole or something, a, a temple, you've got some kind of sacred space. You've got sacred rituals, things to observe, to appease whatever God you're trying to keep happy, so it doesn't whack you when you're not looking. Um, so you've, And you've got certain laws that you're supposed to follow to keep the gods happy. And it's interesting, isn't it, that those same factors underlie just about every culture that's ever existed and every culture that has survived over time has had a religious underpinning of some sort. Even I would argue that atheism in, in uh, fascist or communist states is a religious underpinning. It's anti-religious thought, but it's still a common religious view and an enforced way of thinking and living in terms of who God is. So I, I think religion is what we get very early. 
And I'll, I'll tell you why that's true and, and how God, I think, disconnects us from it. What I mean by getting it is that somehow this salts through our thinking to change the way we live. Actually, the joy of this is in living it. Um, it's not even in taking notes about it. I see some of you feverishly writing notes, and you're welcome to do it because it might help you remember some things. But in the end, I don't care if you have any notes. Because uh, if the Holy Spirit doesn't make this stuff real in you over time, if you're like me, I've got shelves full of notes, and I never go back and read them. And when I do, I read them and go, what did that mean? And, <laughs> or sometimes I'll read something and go, oh, yeah, I forgot. I, geez, I wish I'd remembered that the last five years. That would have been helpful, but didn't. What I want to do with you in this time is kind of like uh, the first flight lesson I ever took. When I was 16 years old, and got my driver's license. I went to my dad and said, you know what? I really want to fly. I want to be a pilot, which he already knew. That was not news. I said, could I have the car on Saturday so I can go to the airport, beg myself a job, and trade job for flight time? And uh, dad said, yeah, if you want to do that, go ahead. Now, I don't know what my dad was thinking, because when my son turned 16, I looked at him and I said, would I let him fly? And I'm thinking, no, I probably wouldn't. But uh, for whatever reason, my dad said, yeah, if you want to do that, go ahead. So I went down, I begged myself a job at the airport from the the local flight instructor washing his airplanes and changing the oil and gassing them up and sweeping the runway, whatever. I painted his house. I did whatever he needed at $1.65 an hour. That was the minimum wage back then. That'll date me. And uh, when I earned $100 of work time, I could trade that for flight time, which the $100 would get me enough flight instruction to where I could solo, which would be about six, seven, eight hours of actual flight instruction. During the course of the working, while I'm earning the $100, I'm going to ground school because I'm learning about navigation. I'm learning about airplanes. I want to learn to fly. So I'm getting it all in the classroom. This is like ground school. You can learn a lot in ground school. We can learn a lot by talking together and recognizing things about God and how he works, and we can do all that. But do you know the one thing you can't do is learn to fly a plane in ground school? You can. Someday you've got to crawl in that airplane with an instructor sitting next to you and go, well, we're going to learn to fly. And when that happened for me, the first lesson I had, I crawled into this plane with my flight instructor, a little Cessna 150, we're crammed in there together. And he looks at me and he says, I'm gonna tell you right now everything you need to know about flying. I thought, wow, it's gonna be easier than I thought. He said, you're sitting in the left-hand seat. That's the pilot seat. He said, you are responsible for everything that goes on in this aircraft. He said, I'm in the right-hand seat. I could be a passenger, I could be a co-pilot. Today, I'm the flight instructor, but I'm responsible for nothing. And then he just turned and looked out the windscreen, and he just sat there. And it's a 50-year-old guy. I'm a 16-year-old kid. And I'm like, okay, what's next? I'm waiting. Certainly the lesson is going to start. And he was just sitting there just looking out the window. And I looked over at him, and he looked at me and smiled and looked back out the window. And I said, what are we doing? He said, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to learn to fly. He said, well, I'm a flight instructor. I could help you do that. <laughs> and he stares out the window again. Oh my gosh, what is it? So I look at him and he smiles and I said, what, when, when are we going to start? He said, we can start whenever you want to start. And he goes quiet again. And I, I really, this is beyond me. My whole understanding of education from the time I was very young is you show up in class and people tell you what you need to know and tell you what you need to do. And you're very passive in the learning process. What this man taught me, he wasn't even a believer. In fact, two years later, he was arrested for smuggling drugs in from Mexico in one of his airplanes. So, <laughs> not, not, a, not a particular man of God in that sense, but uh, what he wanted to teach me about that airplane was, I am responsible for everything. He's responsible for nothing. He's there to help me. He's not there to control me. And he, he taught me more about teaching than anyone I have ever had. I finally looked at him and I said, well, I want to learn to fly, so what do we need to do first? He said, what would you like to do first? I said, we start the plane? He said, we could start the plane, but before we do that, we'd really want to pre-flight the aircraft. And then he went silent again. And by now I'm catching on. I'm going, okay, he's making me ask him for everything. So I said, would you teach me how to pre-flight the aircraft? Oh, I'd love to, he says. And he says, we got to get out of the plane. So we jump out of the plane. He pulls out the checklist. We go all around the whole airplane. We're checking all the flight services, making sure there's no bird nest inside the engine. And we go through the whole thing and crawl back in the plane, and we're done. And he's quiet again. So I'm, I'm really catching on. I said, do we start the plane now? He said, yeah, that'd be good. We can start the plane. He said, would you show me how to start the plane? Happy to, he says. Pulls the checklist out. We go through the whole thing. We're sitting there with the plane running. And he's quiet again. And then, and I'm thinking like, I'm a real pilot now, man. Look at it. Here we go. Here we go. I, I said, um, what do you want to do now? He said, 
What do you want to do? I said, well, um, maybe taxi to the end of the runway. Ah, I said, that'd be a good idea. We could taxi into the runway. I said, would you show me how to taxi? Yeah, I'll show you how to taxi. And, you know, I knew this from ground school. I've been taught it over and over. This is kind of like your wife buying the paper on the first day of your marriage. Um, I know in a little airplane like that, it is not the steering wheel that controls where you're going on the ground. That only works when you're airborne. You steer the plane with the pedals, the rudder pedals. You want to go left, you hit the left pedal. You want to go right, you turn right. But I have been learning for the last year and a half to drive a car. And I've been driving tractors on my dad's farm forever. So when I want to turn something, I'm thinking steering wheel. And I know better. It's pedals. But as we start, as we kind of release the brakes and started to roll, and the plane is going for the gas pumps, I, I'm, and he's going, no, 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 it's the pedals. And as much as I knew it was the pedals, man, every time I got in a tight spot for the first few bit when I was trying to learn to taxi that airplane, I was always turning, I had the steering wheel turned way left like this as I'm pushing on the left rudder to try and get it to turn. And he's just laughing his head off because living it is different than knowing it. And for us to live, learn to live relationally in Father's life, it, it, the instructor that I want next to you in that seat is not me. It's not your best buddy in the body of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who's been assigned that role. But that role, notice, is not a controlling role. I think he mirrors it exactly. The Holy Spirit is there. And the importance of prayer is, as we ask him, gosh, Holy Spirit, I don't get how to steer this. Would you teach me? Oh, I'd love to teach you. And there's an important dynamic. It's not just saying the little incantation. not the Holy Spirit being difficult saying, I won't do it if you don't ask. But if we don't become active learners, if we, if we don't take responsibility for how that vessel, the one you live in, becomes a vessel of God's in the earth and sorts out who he is and learns how to live this life, if you don't take responsibility from it, you're going to miss the best parts of it. If you're not asking him, if you're in the middle of something, say, God, I don't know how to respond to you here. There's no one better to ask than the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how do I respond to this? Would you teach me? And he does. Now, Holy Spirit's not quite like my flight instructor who would answer everything the moment I asked him. The Holy Spirit sometimes, yeah, waits a day or two, week or two, month or two. He's interested in working at a deeper level than just your intellect. So it's not always immediate when I'm saying, Holy Spirit, boy, I don't get this. Help me learn this. Sometimes it's like, uh, do we start the plane now? And the Holy Spirit's saying, oh, my goodness, no, not till we pre-flight the aircraft. So sometimes the Holy Spirit, I want this. He's got something else in mind, but he'll make it very clear. But I'm hoping over the course of these couple of days together, one of the things that can happen is that you really take active ownership of your spiritual life and growth. Uh, most of this is going to be about your personal life. I, I know last time we were here, we were in the coffee shop with a bunch of you, and we talked uh, a couple hours anyway, about, mostly about church issues, right? About leadership and about, you know, where do you meet and what about house church and what about all that stuff. And w we may talk about that some later, but I'm, I'm, I want you to know, most of what we're talking about today, I don't think we get church wrong because we don't understand enough about church. I think we get church wrong because we're not on a relational journey to begin with. Therefore, we don't know what to share when we get together. And so we end up sharing religion is what we share. We share conformity. We share rules and rituals and local holy man gurus. And, and they can be local woman gurus as well. But we, we, sh we end up sharing religious life because we don't know how to share relational life. And I think what the real challenge for the body of Christ to be the body of Christ in our day is to learn how each of us live in him the way he's invited us to do it. I think Jesus spent almost the totality of the gospels on teaching people to learn the life of his father. He didn't teach him how to do church. He only used the term twice. And he didn't teach him to do anything like what we think. He didn't teach him to meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. He didn't teach him to meet Wednesday nights. He didn't teach him to meet in homes and trees and buildings. He didn't teach him any of that stuff. What he wanted them to get is, I want you to get this relationship with Father. And when you get that, then we'll be able to learn in that life together. Does that make sense? Hopefully, in that process, we're all going to be saying, Holy Spirit, you teach me these things. Father, make these real in my life. And hopefully, this sends you on a lifelong journey. I'm not thinking at all that uh, by the end of the week, we'll have everything all sorted out in our lives. Because that's just not true of mine. I'm 12 years into this journey. We're still, God and I, sorting out some things together. All right? So here's where I want to start, if we could. I want to start with a, just a, what I like to call a New Testament survey. I'm going to give you what I think. The, the Gospels, Gospel survey particularly, gives us and then take you to one passage that I think really sets up for what this God always had in mind for us and how it is that we live in Him. 
the gospel start in Matthew, but get through the birth and Jesus and the temptations and the baptism. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is what? Do you remember? Some of you? Sermon on the Mount. It's this wonderful sermon that Jesus gives. Uh, it's all red and red letters if you have one of those kind of Bibles. Um, and basically what I, I just want to say about the Sermon on the Mount for the moment is I, I think Jesus describes the ideal of what it means to live life in God. The life God always meant for us to live. I mean, and if you read the Sermon on the Mount, if, if you read it religiously, it will kill you. Now, I will tell you over the course of these two days, I am a recovering Pharisee. When I first met the Sermon on the Mount as a Pharisee, it's, it wasn't good news. You've heard that it's been said that you shall not commit adultery. I tell you, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed it in your heart. That, that wasn't fair. Not to a Pharisee. Not to who's been keeping the law. You know, I had three brothers. So that thing about you heard that it's been said, thou shalt not kill. I tell you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've killed him anyway. And I went, okay, I really hate that. That's not good news to me. Because I have managed to live with my brothers, whom I hate, and whom I, you know, and mom won't even let us say we hate you. Because if we said that, she would say stuff like, my dad would, if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you haven't seen? So you couldn't say you hate your brother, but we did. And, you know, I gotten through 16 years of not killing him, and I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. And then you read the Sermon on the Mount. And God says, you know what, you're just as guilty as if you'd whacked them anyway. Now, is there a real difference between hating and killing in terms of my brothers? Well, of course there is. Jesus isn't saying in the Sermon on the Mount, hey, if you hate him, you might as well kill him because you're guilty of him. Uh, that wouldn't be the point. Or, hey, I've had lust in my heart. I might as well go ahead and have adultery anyway because I've, I've got the sin. Might as well do the deed. You know, that's not the point. But if you're a Pharisee, you just you hate that Sermon on the Mount. There's stuff in there like you are blessed when you're at the end of your rope, as Eugene Peterson translates the first beatitude. Now, I never I don't know about you. I grew up in a lot of gatherings of congregations of Christians. Notice I didn't call that the church. OK, intentionally. So I think the church is a term that we ought to reserve for what God uses it for. And that's God's people in the earth who know him and love him and follow him. And just because a group of people say we're one doesn't necessarily mean they are. The church is God's people over the whole earth who are knowing who he is and growing in relationship to him. And because of that, growing in relationship to each other. So we'll use church for that. But in one of these congregations, and they've got all these rules and things we're supposed to observe. And boy, when you, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount in that context, it's just not good news. And in all the services I ever attended, I didn't hear anybody ever get up and say, you know what, I want to give a testimony. I'm feeling really blessed because I'm at the end of my rope and I have any idea what I'm going to do. Now, people were blessed because they got money, they got a new job, they got a new house, they got a new something. It was always temporal, material terms is how we define blessings. Jesus, when he goes, here's to the blessed people. They're poor in spirit. They're persecuted. I mean, read that list and you really go, oh my goodness. And God's life is to be a light. We're to be salt and light in the world, impacting the world with God's life. Well, that sounds pretty good. But then it gets into all the rules again. And you think the rules are bad. I'm going to make them even worse, which is not what he was saying at all. I think what the Sermon on the Mount is pointing to is the freedom from sin is not in the actions. It's in the heart. And until I get your heart, your actions won't change. I think what he's actually doing, I'm working on a book with a friend of mine, and I love what... One of the things he says in the course of this book, he's got, he's got this language in God's mouth, the character of God in, in the book he's working on. And um, they're talking about the Ten Commandments and following the rules. And he says, you know, why do you guys call them commandments? This is God talking. Why do you call them commandments? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That wasn't law. That was promise. When you know me well enough, you will not murder. When you know me well enough, you'll have no other gods before me. When you know me, I'd say, wow, now that's, that captures the heart of the New Testament. So it doesn't capture what Moses brought down from the mountain that looked like, here's the rules, follow them or die, which is what Deuteronomy is all about. That's the covenant, do it or die. Um, but this is the heart of God. You will not. I will change you. And Jesus comes and describes this incredible life. Matthew 6, we'll talk, Matthew 6, Luke 12, a little bit later on about not living by anxiety and not worrying about tomorrow, but living every day for its own. Seek first the kingdom. Man, that's beautiful. You get into seven, some more great stuff. Jesus is now describing an ideal way to live in his Father that you and I don't have a prayer of living in our own strength. So if you read the Sermon on the Mount as a Pharisee, it will kill you. 
there's so much in there. And the responsibility is way beyond anything. I mean, even when Jesus, and I don't want you to be anxious about anything. You ever tried not to be anxious? Even when wonderfully well-meaning people come to you and say, Now, Wayne, I don't want you to be afraid, but... See, I don't even know what follows the but. I'm already afraid. So if you tell me I don't need to be, I'm going to be. You tell me not to be anxious, I'm anxious. So, I mean, you read this stuff and go, Man, if that's just the rules, we're dead. But Jesus gave us the ideal. This is what life and Father is like. And then for the next three and a half, four years, He lives that. He, he models that. He demonstrates a life living that ideal, living dependent upon his father, living in a loving way with everybody around him, even people that are trying to kill him and betray him. No hostility, no bitterness, no falling to sin, because he knew how to live related to his father, and he did it. And now we come to the passage that will mostly be in this weekend, which I just love the symmetry of how this even worked out in our printed text. You've got I don't know why they put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the order they did. Not necessarily anointed in that sense. It wasn't written in that order. But what you have the Sermon on the Mount beginning the thing in Matthew. You've got Jesus living it all the way through Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the last bit of John, you get this counterpart to the Sermon on the Mount, which is what we call the Upper Room Discourse. It's almost a fifth of John's Gospel, John 13, 14, 15, 16. And I like to tag the 17 prayer onto that as well. You've got five chapters of now as he's explaining to his disciples, this is how you're going to live what I just lived. This is how you get to live. And so the ideal, he's, the ideal of the Sermon on the Mount is not how, it's what. Jesus models it so we know, wow, it can, it can be done. And now, John 13, 14, 15, 16, here's how I want you to begin to live it. Make sense? We're going to spend a lot of time in John 13, 14, 15, 16, because that's where Jesus, and I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to study every, I'm not going to exegete the whole passage and do all that kind of stuff to you. I just want to kind of look at what this is and what this means. And there's a number of things that happen in this moment that I don't think Christianity as a whole in, in the world really appreciates. I'm going to posit the idea, particularly as a, as a recovering Pharisee, that most of what we do and we call New Testament Christianity is we slap New Testament terms on Old Covenant concepts. Mm -hmm. And because we call it grace and because we call it freedom, we think it is. Mm -hmm. But we still end up, even in Christianity, local holy man guru, sacred space, sacred days, sacred rituals, sacred law. You become a good Christian by following those things. And we have, yeah, we can talk about grace and Jesus dying for our sins. We can use all the language, but miss the reality. I'd like to kind of define the reality this way. I'm going to use three scriptures. Uh, one's taken from the Supper Room Discourse. It's the language of Jesus, John 15, verse 15. You'll know some of this stuff well enough, I think. I no longer call you slaves, but I call you... Why? Remember? What does he say after that? I don't call you slaves, I call you friends. Why? Because everything I've learned from the Father and made known to you. So I'm, I'm giving you the relationship I've had. Notice, this, this, this is one of those passages where we're trading something for something else. It's big, I no longer call you slaves. Well, when did he ever call them slaves? You found the gospel? Hey, slave Peter, come here. Hey, slave John, come over. I don't know that he ever called them slaves. I, I, I don't know... I don't know that he's talking about the way he treated them. He didn't treat them as slaves. So I, I think he's referring to something else. He's not referring to what he called them while they were on the boat across the Sea of Galilee saying, oh, you stupid slaves, let me calm the storm for you. I'm, he never called them slaves. But he is, he is establishing a change in paradigm. There's the old covenant. You can certainly take all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, excuse me, Genesis through Malachi. Let me get the book right. Okay, you can take that whole section of Scripture and really, the image it paints of our relationship to God, is it not slave to sovereign? Is it not king to servant? Is it not? It is. Here's the rules. Here's God. I'm telling you to do this or I'm going to whack you. And the fear of God becomes ultimate in that way of engaging him because fear is what keeps a slave related to the king, to the sovereign. And so now, John 15, I think, is a big clue. I no longer call you slaves. I'm switching the paradigm. I'm switching the image. I'm calling you friends. And not just, you know, chummy little buddy friends. He already defined friendship in this passage. Remember what he said about friends? 
Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. He's about to do that. Big important bit of John 14. He's saying this the night before he's going to be executed. So that's why it's the upper room discourse. Last things he's saying to his disciples. And what he says to them is, I no longer call you slaves. This relationship, you and God, is not about slave to sovereign. It's friend to friend. And not friendship like we describe it. We describe friends as those people around our life that benefit us in some way. Those are our friends. We talk about having friends because there's a mutual... My, my co-writer on the Jake book says, uh, we, you know, he defines church life and love and friendship the way we talk about it humanly as it's the mutual accommodation of self-need. So if you do something for me that benefits me and I do something for you that benefits you and just being near each other's lives is a benefit and a blessing, we talk about friendship. And suddenly, if you need more from me than I'm getting from you, then that friendship gets compromised. In romantic sense, we talk about falling out of love. Because, you know, now I'm not getting the benefit from you I used to get. And you're not getting the benefit from me. And our sense of love and friendship and even fellowship oftentimes is really based on our self-needs. What, what do we need? And am I getting it? And if I'm not getting it, I'm going to go somewhere else and get it. And you're my friend until you go through a hard spot or you betray me or you hurt me in some way. Then you know what? You're not my friend anymore. I'll get some other friends. And all of it centers around my own benefit and what I need. Jesus describes friendship not as what they needed, speaking of the, the Trinity now, but what they were willing to give. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friend. So it's not, he begins to reshape now. This is friend is not just good buddies, but a friend that's willing to die for you. That depth of friendship. A friend that would never betray you. Never use you. Never exploit you. A friend that would always be there for your benefit, not theirs. That's the level of friendship he's describing. Paul says it this way, Romans 8.15. I, again, I think one of those transitional theme passages. I think... John 15, 15, I just gave you the words of Jesus is a theme passage of the Upper Room Discourse. What I'm going to give you now in Romans 8, 15 is the theme passage of Romans. I could read you the whole book and it makes the same point. Here's the point from Romans 8, 15. God has not given us a spirit of fear leading to slavery again. Well, wouldn't that indicate he had at some point? That God had given us a spirit of fear and that it did lead to slavery. And that was the way that God worked through the courts of the old covenant. He said, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear leading to slavery again. But he's given us what? A spirit of? Spirit of what? No, that's a different verse. That's in Timothy. Huh? A spirit of adoption. Whereby our hearts cry out what? Abba. The old Papa thing. Scott. Yeah, the question is, wasn't, weren't there Abraham called the friend of God and that sense of friendship? David getting past the sacrifices to say, that's not what you want. You want a broken and contract. Do I think God always wanted this relationship of friendship with us? I, I believe he did. Did some of the old covenant people see through that at slender moments of their lives? They did. Could they participate in it the way we can? And the answer is no, they couldn't. Because a major thing hadn't happened yet, and that was the cross. Jesus even says it himself, among those born of women, no one greater than who? John the Baptist. And that's, that's better than Moses, better than Isaiah, better than Daniel, better than David, I mean, better than Abraham. No one born of women is better than John the Baptist. And he or she that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now see, that's amazing language. The benchmark's John the Baptist. Nobody before him had it any better. And yet, the least in the kingdom is better than John. Why? Better people? No. Have access to a better relationship. Because all of those men of the Old Covenant, before the death on the cross and the dealing with our sin and shame, which we'll talk about this afternoon, until that happened, we couldn't be near God and befriend Him. As much as God wanted to be our friend, we didn't feel like we could be near Him and be safe. Because even language of Hebrews 9 and 10, which we'll revisit in a little bit, all the Old Testament sacrifices for all the things they were doing, what couldn't they do? They couldn't make the worshiper perfect 
in conscience. Hebrews 9 and 10. This whole argument there. All the sacrifices, all the things, you know, kill the lamb, put the blood on the scapegoat, send it out into the wilderness, offer the lamb into the... Do all the hocus pocus that God asked for and it still didn't make you feel clean. When you, not near, when you got near God, He was a terrifying presence. And isn't that true through the whole of the Old Testament? When God shows up on Mount Sinai, you don't have the sense of friend. You don't. When God asks you to kill your only son, take him up and throw him up on, a, on an altar and kill him, uh, you know, whatever Abraham understood about friendship with God, he didn't live the most of his life there. He didn't. He may have discovered that in the course of it, but oh God, my goodness, he's lying about his wife to keep her from getting raped by Pharaoh. That was a good plan for you. I've got a Sarah at home, and I'm, I'm trying to think about this. If I was in a situation where someone's going to kill me and, and rape her or just rape her without killing me, I can't imagine Sarah thinking that's a good deal. Yeah, we'll just lie. So, yeah, you get out of it. I'll get, I, 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 I'm okay with that. I, yeah, gee, Sarah would not be okay with it. How much? So Abraham is really struggling into this reality. Isaiah, he has a vision of being in God's presence. What's his immediate reaction? Woe is me. Woe is me. He falls on his face. Wicked man that I am. We're not talking about, oh, hi, God, how you doing? <laughs> Moses, as close as he knew God, God said, you know what? I can't let you look me face to face. It will kill you. But I'll, I'll put you in the rock and I'll pass by and I'll pull my hand away. You can see my back. More than that is going to kill you. Mount Sinai, bring the people to me. I want, to, I, want to sp I want to speak to my people. People get to Mount Sinai, what happened? Were they excited to be there? Oh, okay, admittedly, a little thunder, a little lightning, a little earthquake could be a bit unnerving. But at the end of it, it was, you know what, Moses? You go up and deal with that. I, we're going home. Find out what that wants. Let us know. And we'll do whatever you say. Did they ever do whatever he said? I mean, it's just God's not in the old covenant an endearing presence. Now, I think God, because God is an endearing presence, he was an endearing presence even through the old covenant. We have a God who has not changed. God didn't get saved somewhere between Malachi and Matthew and say, I could probably do this better. I think the old bad cop didn't work, so I'm going to do the good cop. In fact, most of our tradition... Christian traditions, God doesn't even get through the New Testament as the good cop. When I was growing up, God was the scary guy. Jesus was the good guy. And it was good cop, bad cop. It was God ready to judge me for all the garbage I'd done. And I'm led into that courtroom. And God looks at me and he says, guilty. It was told to me this way. I remember in Sunday school, scared. guilty Wayne. And then Jesus jumps up because we have an advocate with the Father. See, and that's a legal term because we need a lawyer with God because God's scary guy. Jesus jumps up and says, oh, I died for him. You can't kill him. And it was like God going, oh, not another one. You know, and it was, it was this good cop, bad cop. When you really needed, you know, more repentance and better living, you got the God that wanted to whack you. And then when you, could do, when you perform fairly well, then you got the Abba. Oh, the Abba God. God's, a, God's an Abba. And we, man, we teach that all the time, but we, I didn't live it. I didn't know what that meant. I grew up like the schizophrenic son of an abusive father. Yeah. You're never sure what God's coming around the corner next. Is it the Abba guy? Come jump in my lap. Let's have fun. Or is it that wrathful, vengeful guy that wrote Revelation that just can't wait to whack somebody with wrath? Which one is it? And what you finally come down to when you grow up in that tension is, well, it depends on me. And does it sound healthy? The reason we grow up with the God of religion is because if, it's, if he is that God, you want religion between you and him. You want a buffer. You want a local holy man guru. You want some rules you can follow. Just go into a meeting once a week. I can do that. Just read the Bible every day. I can do that. I can find a few rules. I can get that right. And then somebody else deal with him. When Paul writes, we've not been given a spirit of fear leading to slavery again, but we've been given a spirit of adoption whereby our hearts cry out, Abba. He's now down to the core of it. The relationship God has always wanted with us is not a relationship of slave to sovereign, of master to servant. 
It is the relationship of a father to a child that's Abba aged. Not teenager aged, Abba aged. I've got a little Abba kid at home. I've got an 18 month old granddaughter. She gets in my, she's at the, she's on my, my dad, dad. She's at that stage. I'm telling you what, it is just a joy to be with Amy. Amy get everything right? No, Amy's an idiot. She's only 18 months old. <laughs> she can't even ask for what she wants for dinner. She can't even tell us if she needs a sweater yet. She can't, she can't even, she's really just, she's funner than the dickens to be with. And when we hear her wake up from her nap at our house, it is a fight between who gets to her room first between Sarah and me. Because there's nothing like opening that door and watching Amy's face just light up. There is nothing like it. Mostly I'm home because Sarah's at work and I'm, my daughter's overworking for me a few hours a week. So I get to get Amy. And then when Sarah's home, I kind of let her because she doesn't get to do it as often. <laughs> but I still go in behind her because it's that moment with Amy that's the best. It's playing with Amy. It's Amy on my lap reading a book. She doesn't even know what we're talking about. She doesn't get the words yet. I has no idea. And how much expectations do I have of Amy? None. I just love her. And that love, if she grows up in that love, that love will transform her. My love for her, her parents' love for her. That's what, God, that's what Paul's describing here. It's the Abba Daddy that he's invited us to engage. And that changes everything. It's not the rituals of a, of a God that needs to be appeased. It's a God, and I'll use a better word than love, because we, even in those religious settings, we sing songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know. Again, Jesus is the good guy. God's the bad guy. But we sing it, and we don't really mean it. We don't really understand it, because we grow up under these weight of expectations. I, he will love me if I do all these things, and it just does not work. We end up in same religiously engaged as we were before. Romans 8, 15, powerful, powerful verse. And then Romans, or 1 John, excuse me, 4. So from Jesus' own mouth, from Paul's mouth, and now from John's mouth, where he talks about God is love, and in him there is no darkness at all. And in perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Is there a fear not equated with punishment? Pardon? Is there a fear that's you know, I, I think we, we play fast and loose with some of the scripture stuff. I heard always growing up that the fear of Proverbs about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or, or the Psalms is a healthy respect for who God is. And First John is about the fear that has to do with punishment. I actually think they're the same thing. I actually think there's such a, a huge paradigm shift going on Old to New Testament, Old Covenant to New. That he is really saying, look, fear was the old way to get it right. If, and, I, and I say this to everybody, if you don't love God, you'd be well served to fear him. Because fearing God and will keep you from doing some really stupid things. I mean, I, I, was, taught, I was raised in the fear of the Lord. Um, man, I, I hardly did anything wrong as a kid. Just because I knew if I did one little thing wrong, I'd get caught and I'd go to hell. And boy, hell didn't sound fun to me. So the fear of the Lord, did it keep me from a lot of things that my fellow classmates and people growing up in the free love and free drugs of the 60s were doing? It did keep me from a lot of stuff that I appreciate. Did it help me know God better? No. Did it change me from the inside? No. Did it drive my sin deeper and it came out in more religious ways? Oh, yes, it did. That's why I say I'm a recovering Pharisee. I'm not using it tritely. I was that goody two-shoes kid that grew up that did everything right, that I obnoxious to my classmates. I think I look back at high school and no wonder they hated me. I was so righteous, disgustingly so. And I had the truth and they were all pagan sinners going to hell. And oh, just I quiver when I look back. There's nothing about my life that would have been engaging to those those kids. other than, And I had a pool of kids who were also Pharisees with me, so I wasn't alone in them. So I had friendships. But so if you don't love God, you'd be well served to fear him. Once you love him, you will never need to fear him again. And I think that is the message of the New Testament. And the man, I did this at a seminary one time, and I got attacked by the class because, you know, the fear of the Lord is really important. And, you know, fear of the Lord is where we get holiness from. And so they were all over me on this fear issue. And I just said, well, let me ask you one question. What is it that God fears? What do you mean what is God? God doesn't fear anything. God's God. He doesn't fear, he doesn't fear anything. I said, yeah, he's holy. You're telling me fear derives from holiness, and yet God fears nothing, and he's holy. 
So that was confused him a little bit. Where does God derive his holiness? Love. If I absolutely love every person I meet, I would never need a law of any kind. I don't need the rules for my marriage. I know their marriage rules. I know I'm not allowed to have sex with anybody else. I know the rules. I, I, and I believe in the rules. But I don't stay faithful to Sarah because it's the rules. I've had 31 years of loving this woman. I love Sarah from the core of my being. I am loved by her absolutely, totally, more than anyone in this planet ever has or ever will. I have that kind of love from Sarah. Am I going to do anything that would hurt or defraud or betray her? No. Not to keep the rules. Because love has won me. I think that's this paradigm, the shift. When you live loved, you will love. And love, the Galatians 5 says it absolutely. Here's the deeds of the flesh. But what fulfills the law? Love. Love. When you get the loving right with him, with each other, the keeping is not an issue. Law is not an issue. In fact, when you love, love will take you further than the law ever will. The law just says you can't do this. And so, okay, we well, can do everything but that. You know, the marriages I saw growing up, the only, the only rule was you couldn't get divorced. So they may treat each other like hell. And they did. I knew some very, very bad marriages. But they were good marriages because they, they were never divorced. That's the rule. Couldn't change them. The rule in marriage, oh, goodness, aren't, aren't rules pretty cheap compared to a depth of love that a man and woman can experience together in this life and partnership on a journey? I mean, the, the rules are, mean nothing to Sarah and me. They're not even important. Not anymore. Did they serve us at a time in our life when we might have done something weak and stupid? Yeah, maybe they did. I thought I loved Sarah completely on the day I married her. I dated her three and a half years for Pete's sake. That's, you know, more than most friends had dated before they got married. But now at 31 years, Sarah and I laugh at her. Or we didn't even know what love was. We had no idea. It was a mutual accommodation of self-need. It really was in the early days of our marriage. So we could both get out of it and what we both really enjoyed about each other. And it was all about us. It was all about me, what I get out of this. 31 years into it, oh my goodness, it is so different. And neither Sarah nor I are the same people we first met and married. We're, we're not even close. So I, uh, the scripture I'm giving you, I think there is a whole flip here. I think what he's saying, the man who's perfected is perfected by what? Love. Perfect love. Yeah. Is fear, does fear have a value when you don't understand Father's love? Yes, fear has a value. And I think Scripture teaches that. Once you engage that love, fear will have no place. You will not need it. It will not be a blessing to you. In fact, the fear that I think he's talking about in 1 John is the fear that I can't get near God. The fear that Adam and Eve had from day one in the garden when they have to ate that fruit. And God comes to see them and they're hiding. They're already afraid of him. who would come every day in the garden. They've never been afraid of him before. And now they're afraid of them. We'll talk about that too more down the road. And that's the paradigm shift. I think he says in the beginning of this upper room discourse that we're still trying to get back to, John 13, 14. He, he said, and all along people have been asking me, you know, well, what's the law say? And, and they, they always sum it up with the greatest command. Love God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's been the answer to, uh, you know, what's the law? What's sum up the whole law? And it's, it really is kind of absurd, isn't it? Do you know anybody you can command to love you? I think the whole idea of that, it really, if, we, if we took a look at it, we're so used in religious settings to commanding things like love because we see love as an act. If love is an act, yes, you can command me to act like I love you. You could do that. But can you command love? Can I command Sarah to love me? It's absurd, isn't it? Not, not when love is affection. Not when love is the reality of a relationship. It's not an action. We, religion turns love into an act. I remember sitting through a wedding of a, a friend of my daughter's. And the, the pastor read the uh, 1 Corinthians 13 love bits about love is kind, love is patient, love does all these things. And Great passage of scripture. I love it. He's reading it to a couple. Often done at weddings. And then the man says this. He says, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. One, day, one night a week for the rest of your lives as a married couple, I want you to sit down. Read this part of 1 Corinthians 13 to each other out loud. And then I want you to each look at the other partner and say to, to, to your spouse, how have I failed to love you like this in the past week? Just went, what? What is this man saying? 
This is a recipe for divorce if I've ever heard one. <laughs> if Sarah and I are going to sit down every week and say, okay, honey, here's how you failed me this past week. And she's going to tell me how I failed her this past week. We're divorced by Friday. I got to tell you, this is not fun. And this is a newly married couple. My goodness, they have no idea what love is. How are you going to give them an assignment like that? But that's what religion does to 1 Corinthians 13. It makes it the rules. 1 Corinthians 13, this is the way God is. When you see this in your life, patience, kindness, uh, you know you've engaged God's love. So you get to know that. And then as you see God transforming you, so now you're in situations where you used to be impatient, and now you're patient, you're going, ooh, that's not me. That's God's kind of loving. Marty. Oh, that's a great question. That's why we're here. <laughs> the next six, eight hours is going to try and answer that question. So it's a perfect question. I love it. I love it. Yeah. When Jesus gets to the upper room discourse, the language changes now. It's not this I command you to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and neighbor yourself. John 13, 34, and 35. It's theme verses from John. A new commandment I give you. What is it? That you love one another. Okay, that, a new commandment I give you kind of wipes out everything before. It kind of says that's obsolete. We're giving a new program now. I'm giving you something new. It's not an upgrade. It's new. New commandment I give you. I just want you to love each other as I've loved you. That kind of sounds like we're coming back to the love thing again. What Jesus is saying, it, it puts it in, in the command. See, so, now here's how religion takes that. Okay, now Jesus loved John and Peter and James in a certain way. If I study the New Testament, I'm going to figure out how God loved them. And then I'm supposed to love Carmen in that way. And by that, all the world will know. So we turn love into an act yet again. Jesus is talking about something very real. Listen, I've loved you guys in a certain way. I want you to go love. First John says it this way, we know love by this, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. Implicit in the new command is, I cannot possibly love you until I've been loved by him. Can't possibly. I can't begin to love you. I will only use you. My love, I may even be trying to be nice to you and, and do compassionate things for you, but until I've been loved, I can't love. It's not I'm supposed to love you like he loved John. I can't love you until I know what his love is. And the whole upper room discourse is how you experience that love. The first act of living in, relationally is throwing out the principles and learning to live in a love relationship. Learning to live loved. I, it's, it seems selfish, yeah, because it's not others first. No, it's not others first. It's until you know the love of the Father for you and the love of his Son, until you know that to the core. You wake up and you know Father delights over you far more than I delight over Amy getting up from her nap. Until you know that, until that's real in your life and experience, intellectual, yes. Emotional, yes. Until you know the depth of that love, you'll have no idea how to treat other people. So the whole upper room discourse, it, it just keeps coming back to this new command I give you, love one another as I've loved you. But the whole upper room discourse is, here's how we're going to love you. Here's how we get the loving. Because here's the deal with God. We talked about God in the Old Covenant, scary guy. Every time he shows up, people die, people hide. It's scary, right? Now, Jesus has been living with these guys for three and a half years. Is he, Jesus, is he God in the flesh? He is. He is God. He is with them. No one's hiding in the bushes. No one's falling on their faces going, Oh, wicked people that we are. You know, we come from a gen Why are they not? It's God. He's with them. Why are they not? Oh, he spooked him a couple times. Yeah, granted, comes a storm, spooked him like no. that guy. But overall, hanging out Mary and Martha's house, Bethany, Peter and mother-in-law's house in Galilee, on the boat, going across, guys fighting over who gets to be first in the kingdom. They were pretty comfortable around this guy, weren't they? Why? Why? Huh? Part of the love thing, but why? Pardon? He just hung out with them. Okay, we're getting there. But why? He didn't hurt them. Pardon? He accepted them. All that stuff. Yeah. He was their friend. Yeah. I want you to have some fun for a while. Don't worry about the right answers. We're just having fun. They had no idea who he was. Yeah. 
cheater. <laughs> Didn't they not have any idea who he was? Had no idea. He was God. <laughs> Why was no one hiding from him? They had no idea who he was. They didn't know he was God. Even when they thought he was the Messiah, the first century Jewish hope of a Messiah was not a God incarnate figure. It was like a Moses, a man, God uniquely empowered to deliver his people. They're not looking for God hanging out in the flesh. We're looking for it. So even when they're saying he's the Messiah, they have no idea what that means. And they come to this upper room, and here's what's going on in the upper room. The next time Jesus sees them after the upper room experience and the cross, he's not coming through doors anymore. Right? Suddenly they're going to know this is the God of the universe. And the first thing he says to them when he appears through the wall, remember? What does he say? Don't be afraid. There's a whole lot of language in the upper room discourse and beyond it now. Okay, don't be spooked by this because it's going to come home to them a few days from now. They have no idea who he is. Yeah, great teacher, healer, man of God. Yeah, all that. But, but all the things you said, he'd set them at ease. He was able to with them. He didn't hurt them and exploit them. He didn't take offerings from them. He just loved them. He just poured out his life to them. That's all he did. And they got comfortable around him. They enjoyed him. He'd become their friend and brother. And now, you know, this is uh, Wednesday night. Sunday night, he's going to be hanging out with them in an upper room. And you know what? It's going to be obvious who he is. See, when I travel around, it's difficult in rooms this size. But some places where I get to travel, I get to hang out with a group of people gathering in a room. And they have no idea who I am. They don't know I'm the speaker. And I just knew someone was Wayne. And they still don't get it. And I get to talk to them about their family, what's going on with their lives, and I get a great conversation with them. And we're sitting down, talking, and the service starts. And at some point, they're saying, introduce me. And I get up, and you should hear them gasp. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. See, that's just the speaker, author from out of town box thing. That's not a very big box. The God box is huge. But people change in some environments when they figure out who I am just because oh you're the guy that's this and they'll come up to me after the deal and go you know I'm sorry I went on about my kids and job and I say you know if you remember I was the one that asked you about your kids and job yeah. oh that's right <laughs> see because that box that box is a frightful thing Jesus is coming back he'll be in that God box they're going to know now and the upper room discourse I, I believe this whole 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17 is Jesus taking this wonderfully tender relationship he had cultivated with these men and women, including Mary and Martha and others, and he's throwing it past the cross, past the resurrection, to when he comes back to be with them. And he didn't want to lose this relationship in that new reality. He had already defined the relationship. No longer call you servants, call you friends.